Hello there, my name is Jeremy Hollifield and I'm speaking to you from Derry Gospel Hall, which is in South Wales. And this is a second of three recordings where I'm presenting to you verses of scripture that we have hanging on the walls of our meeting place. You might say I'm speaking about the writings that are on the wall. And as that phrase would suggest, I'm presenting verses of the Bible to you today as certainties, as statements of inevitability, as the phrase, the writing on the wall would suggest. In the first of these recordings, we considered the words of the Lord Jesus who said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in this second recording, I'd like to consider with you the verse that we have upon the wall behind me. It's taken from the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible, chapter number 16, and it comes from verses 30 and 31. What must I do to be saved is the question that is asked, and the response to the question comes back, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is a very frequently used verse by gospel preachers. Maybe you've heard it before. But perhaps if you haven't heard it, and you're not acquainted with that part of the Bible that it comes from, I wonder, who do you think would have raised such a question? And out of what circumstances did it arise? Well, in a moment, I'll come to that as it's related to us in Acts chapter 16. And I think you'll find that it comes from a most unlikely source and it comes out of most strange circumstances. But let me paint something of the, the picture of what is going on in Acts chapter 16 for you. It's a momentous chapter insofar as the development of the Acts of the Apostles is concerned. For in Acts chapter 16, the gospel message is recorded as arriving in Europe for the first time. Paul and his colleague Silas, preachers of the gospel, arrived in what we now know today as being northern Greece. And they landed at a, a city, a significant city in the region, which was called Philippi. And as was their wont, they set about preaching the gospel as soon as they arrived in town. And this message, this message had dramatic impact in Philippi as it arrived. It was a new message. It was something that had never been heard before. The message which we are preaching to you today, the message of the grace of God. It had an impact in the life of a businesswoman, a lady by the name of Lydia. And she was a convert to Christ as a result of preaching. It also had an impact upon a young woman in the city of Philippi who was demon-possessed. This young woman would follow the preachers around about the city and would holler after them, These men are the servants of the Most High God. They show unto us the way of salvation. Mark you, there's many a true word recorded in the New Testament as spoken by demons. And what she said was right. These men were serving the Most High God, and they were showing to the people of Philippi the way of salvation. Or you might say, that's a very bold claim. These strangers coming into town presuming to suggest that they had the way of salvation? What made them so certain of their message? Well, I offer to you, it was the fact that they had experienced that salvation for themselves. Paul would write to a friend of his called Timothy, and he would say how that God had saved us, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace. And Paul could attest from first-hand experience the salvation of God. 
I offer to you. That is my qualification this evening to be preaching to you the gospel message and declaring the way of salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't claim any academic understanding or qualification. I've not been through theological college. My, my collar is around the way that you see it on screen. I don't have the accolades of men to qualify me to be a preacher of the gospel. But what I do have is the experience of having been saved. When I confessed my sin to God and took his promise from out of the word of God, that if I were to confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And taking God at his word, I became a possessor of the salvation of God. And I offer to you this way of salvation as being the only way to be saved is by placing your trust in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to be your saviour. Paul exercised those demons from out of that young woman in Philippi. And while she enjoyed being liberated, there were those who were rather upset at the fact that she had been set free. You see, this young woman was being exploited for her ability to tell fortunes or maybe foretell events. There were those who made gains from her services. And they were rather put out at these preachers who had decimated their income. They concocted an accusation against Paul and Silas that these men being Jews were preaching things that it was not lawful for them to observe, being Romans. You see what they were doing? They were trying to make out that the message of the gospel was unlawful. Might I just say, there are those who are striving to that end in our day. And they would dearly love to have on the statute book the fact that to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to engage in unlawful activity. That would be a sad day for our society were the voice of the preacher to be silenced on the streets. Well, they took Paul and Silas, and they beat them, and they, they threw them into the prison house, awaiting their, their trial. But Paul and Silas, far from being dispirited, were found in their cells, singing praises to God and in prayer. When at midnight, God intervened in a miraculous way, and he caused an earthquake to descend upon Philippi that shook the prison house that unloosed the doors of the cells, that caused their shackles to, to be loosed. The jailer, when the debris had settled, when he viewed the open cells, he thought the worst. And he thought that the prisoners had escaped as a result of being set free through the earthquake. And coming to the conclusion that those who were under his jurisdiction had fled, he decided that he would take his own life because surely now the authorities would seek to take his life from him for his dereliction of duty. But then a voice came out of the cell. It was the Apostle Paul. And he said, do yourself no harm. We are still here. And the jailer bound into the cell and he found that it was the case that not one had fled from out of the prison. It's at that realization that these words were uttered by the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? And the answer came back from Paul. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What must I do to be saved? That was an unusual question 
for the Philippian jailer to express at that point in time. You would think that his danger had just been averted, that it had passed. When he saw that the prisoners had not fled and that his, his life was no longer in danger because of dereliction of duty, you would have thought that the man would have breathed a sigh of relief. But rather, he still had a mind that he required saving. And he uttered these words, what must I do to be saved? Maybe in our society just now, there are those who are thinking that they are past danger. The pandemic is maybe ebbing somewhat compared to how harsh it was when it was in full fury. Maybe you've been jabbed twice or three times. Maybe you're feeling as if you have a certain degree of safety now and danger is past. What kind of reaction does that cause in you? Is it one of breathing out? Is it one of seeking to live it up for the, those months of uh, constraint that we've had to endure? Or is it perhaps that you are given to reflection, just like the Philippian jailer was, though his danger would appear to have been averted, he still had a mind that he needed being saved. Where did he get this notion that there was another danger that he was in, in line of? Well, I rather think that that gospel message much, must have reached his years in Philippi. I rather think that being there, you could not have escaped what these men were preaching in, in that city. We read elsewhere what the character of Paul's preaching was. When he wrote to a church in Colossae, he, say, he says, We preach warning every man and teaching every man. You see, not only is the gospel about bringing the, the good news of free salvation, it also has a solemnizing note. It also has a note of warning. And it would be remiss of me in delivering the gospel to you via this recording if I didn't point out the warning associated with rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour. The previous verse that we considered from John chapter 14 said, No man cometh unto the Father but by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only means of introduction to God. He is the only means whereby I can be accepted by God. He is the only one that I can refer to for salvation. I can't save myself or look to another. And if I refuse to accept the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I am in receipt of the consequences of that rejection. And that is not to be able to enjoy the Father's house, which is heaven. And rather, I would be consigned to a lost eternity away from God. I think that Paul preached that gospel when he was in Philippi, warning every man of the danger of passing from time into eternity in your sins, as well as teaching every man of the opportunity that the gospel message presents them with. This man said, what must I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul responded with the answer, believe, on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. There was only one active word in that answer that he gave. There was only one verb, and that was believe. That's all that the Philippian jailer had to do, was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in his capacity to be saviour, and he would be saved. He didn't have to work for his salvation, he didn't have to pay for it. There wasn't a sacrifice that he had to make. No, no, all of those things were done 
by the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. The work has been completed. The price has been paid for our redemption. The one sacrifice for sin forever has been made by God's Son, who laid down his life as a sacrifice for sin. All we have to do is believe it. Place our faith in that being the God-ordained means for saving men and women. The only way that we can be saved, being cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledging Jesus as Lord, we shall be saved. I trust that you might reflect upon this question and the answer that was given to it. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, the word of God says. If you have any further questions, then please feel free to submit them on the platform that you've listened to this recording today. Thank you very much, and may God bless you.